So I've been trying to take this public, public position to drive solutions and funding to areas that folks just frankly are voiceless. Well, welcome back everybody from our, uh, our networking session. As you can see, I have Congressman David Trone with me uh, today. Very, very excited about it. Uh, we were talking that this goes back, uh, David uh, goes back to 2003 or four was the first time we had him at one of uh, my networking groups. Uh, he was a great crowd pleaser at that time, exciting entrepreneur. Uh, had him back in roughly 2008-9 range, again a big hit. And now as congressman, uh, I'm excited to hear about what this new world is like uh, for you. Uh, but quick question for you, just wanted to check, family safe? Yeah, no, thank you, Ron. Everybody's good. We're sheltered in place in Potomac and happy campers. Uh, I, I I don't see you as a person that shelter in place would go over very well, but uh, I'm glad to hear that everybody's everybody's good. Uh, you know, in in preparation for having you on, I, I I was looking up your territory, and let me just it, if I I might for just a, a minute here is to show the audience your the territory. Um, that you cover and can you just kind of tell us a little bit about what it's like to cover that big swatch of land here if, if for everybody on your screen it's uh, district six uh, but congressman trone could you tell us a little bit about that territory and what it's like to serve that territory no, it does really make it a, a unique territory because it's the ninth largest district from end to end so from river road in Potomac to the far end of Garrett County, it's four hours uh, driving time. Uh, so I spend a lot of time on the road, but it's two completely uh, distinct constituencies. You know, we have this, you know, suburban Montgomery County, Gaithersburg, Germantown, Frederick, and then the upper three Western counties, you know, Washington, Allegheny, and Garrett are, I mean, yesterday I held a farmer's call. So we <laughs> talked yesterday about dairy, dairy supports, livestock, depopulating livestock, all kinds of crop supports. So you really get a real different look uh, and different set of questions. Very Republican in the upper three districts, uh, three counties, very Democrat down here. And, and that works well for me. I mean, everywhere they like a business person, yeah. someone that's met a payroll for you know, 35 years. Uh, so that's, that goes over well. They, they get the common sense and um, is very, very bipartisan focused. Yeah. Yeah. So they accept you, the, the Republicans out West accept you? I do pretty well. I'm probably not going to carry those counties. Oh, really? Uh, I've done better uh, than any other Democrats ever done. Yeah. Uh, let's put it that way. And I spend a significant amount of time in those counties because uh, they kind of feel left behind. Uh, so I put offices in Hagerstown and Cumberland, plus one in Frederick and one in Gaithersburg. Gotcha. Uh, you know, in my discussions with members of the NABO audience over the last couple of weeks in preparation for having you on board today, uh, the, the, the one question that came up in a variety of uh, ways was that you built this huge retail business, nationwide business. And this was a good question that was asked by one of, uh, one of my members what do you see as the difference between customer care from running that retail business and constituent service? How's that? You know, how do you how do you juggle that? Is it the same? Is it different? Tell us about it. Yeah, I think it's got an awful lot uh, of similarities. I mean, most folks in Congress talk about their constituents. Um, I tend to talk about the customers, and because that's what I look at it. Uh, doesn't matter, Republican, Democrat, Independent. Anywhere, you know, those are the customers, and it's my job uh, to get customer satisfaction. You know, in our business at Total Wine and More, you know, we measure those, you know, scores literally in every single store across the country on an ongoing basis, and we track that and mm -hmm. have a lot of great metrics. But the key is having your team 
Uh, and we've got a really good team. I mean, I've got 9,000 team members across the country and now 27 states. So I got the HR piece. I get that. Yeah. But in Congress, the staff is maximum 18 people. That's it. That's the budget you get. So I think we've got a great team. That's the focus. You know, how we keep them motivated. We all see the same vision. We all understand the steps we're trying to take to get there. And we've got a lot of focus because if we try and, you know, boil the ocean and look at every particular thing that comes into your radar, you'll never get anything done. So you've got to pick your shots and stay focused, uh, but really, really have that customer service bent uh, at all times. We have a simple rule. If you have a question, we get back to you the same day. Um, and we've been tracing folks for unemployment, you know, helping PPP, you know, anything folks need, uh, we run it to earth. And I think we've got the best customer service culture, you know, anywhere. And if you have a need, take a look at our, on trone.house.gov, we have a hundred some page resource guide for COVID. And that's what you do in business. You get the best ideas, steal them from all over the country, put them in one place and deliver it efficiently. Uh, and that's what we've done, you know, on the web there. Oh, good. I, I, I will use that to uh, give out to my members of uh, my, my groups because I, I think all of us are sort of searching for, and we're getting overloaded with so much information coming from so many different uh, places. Uh, so wh which is more challenging for you, running that retail business or, or running, <laughs> running things as a congressman? Well, certainly uh, business is one heck of a lot more fun uh, Frank. Yeah. Uh, business is a beautiful thing about it. It's a, it's a marriage system. So if we get it right, we win, we move forward. Um, Congress, uh, sometimes in public service, people fall forward. And sometimes you wonder what the heck happened, how this, how they get here. Yeah. Uh, but at the end of the day, I think that the key where it can really move the needle and really make a difference in people's lives in the area that I'm focused on, opioid addiction, you know, mental health, looking at the criminal justice system, which I think is very, in many cases, unjust for people of color. And of course, medical research, trying to get government to think long term. All my history in business to go from, you know, at Wharton and, you know, a failed farm to, you know, we're $4 billion business. It's all been about trying to think long term. And that's what Congress does not do well at all. Right. They're about today, today's election. And that's just a lousy strategy you know, they need to be thinking about our kids and their kids. If you put that first, uh, we'd make better decisions. Great, great. You know, uh, another, you know, of course, we're all sort of COVID-19 just focused right now. And, you know, we're all locked in place at home. Uh, and it's, it's been tough. There's been a lot of stress. Uh, I deal with small businesses. So I deal with businesses in that million to maybe 30 million revenue range. And, you know, one of the things that we keep hearing is, feedback is that a lot of their staff for the first time have gone virtual and the stresses of being at home. Uh, are you hearing that from your constituents? Yeah, I think you see across the country, uh, the mental health challenges are just phenomenal. Isolation was already an issue uh, for a lot of our seniors, but now we're suffering isolation for large swaths of the American people. And everybody has moved, you know, to Tela. And we're also seeing failures in the broadband system. So we've got major inequities in rural and also urban deserts, the inner cities where we don't have good, fast broadband. 42% of the low income folks in the US don't have the adequate broadband to keep up on teleeducation. Use telemedicine and really effectively telework. Right. So this COVID's exposed this soft underbelly of failure on, and we take it for granted, most of us, because we, we love technology, we live in it. Uh, but all of my Western counties, and even Montgomery County, yesterday the Chamber of Commerce, Gigi was talking about, we've got areas that do not have good broadband. And so that we've got to fix for the country. This new bill has $5 billion in it but we need an $86 billion cure. It should be bipartisan, uh, but the isolation is gonna continue for quite a while. This isn't going away anytime soon as we know. 
Uh, I have one more question for you, and then I'm going to turn it over to you, and you, you know, you, you, you tell us what your your goals are for Congress and what you want to achieve. But uh, along with this COVID nineteen, one of uh, one of my uh, members asked the question: How will Congress measures the success of the economic response to COVID nineteen? You had mentioned everybody's kind of short sighted thinking. Are they even thinking, I, I, I know we come out and we throw money at problems, but has anybody sat back and said, what's the goals? How do we know that we're successful in this? Because any businessman or woman has to answer that question. And you know, those of us that are sitting on the outside say, well, Congress never seemed to ask that question. Yeah, I think that's a really great, great uh, point, Ron. And that's, nobody is. It's really, as you said, it's throw money at it. The problem is just unbelievably huge, and we need to throw the money. I mean, there's no question about it. You, know, you all can see that in your lives, but uh, no one has said, hey, by second Q, 2Q or 3Q of 2021, you know, we want to try and get unemployment from 20% down to 15 yeah. or 14. What's the GDP? You know, how are we going to move the gross domestic product? You know, those kind of challenges which we all have in our business i mean we live on metrics everybody's bonused on metrics that are generally tied back to ebitda uh, but we're not you don't see that in congress it's not even part ever part of the discussion it's just it's the desire to show a lot of action and there's a lot it's that's a lot to be said for that uh, because we need to do 20 different things in 20 different categories because there's so many people you know so many that need help Right, uh, unprecedented, and we'll never see it again. Oh. I hope. Yeah, uh, let's hope not. Uh, let's do this. Let's turn it over to you, Congressman Trone, and and you know, give us an idea of what you're working on, what your passions are in, in Congress, and and then when you're done, we'll it, you just tell us when you're ready, and then we'll open up questions to the group. Okay, great. I, I first want to make sure we talk a little bit about the Heroes Act and what needs to happen next, because that kind of can set the stage for any questions uh, that might come in, because there's been a lot of mistakes made in the CARES One Act that just don't make any damn sense. Mm -hmm. And you write a bill that's 1,500 pages, uh, which, you know, pretty much impossible to read, and certainly not getting the details, you know, you're going to have all kinds of mistakes in it. And there were a legendary number of mistakes. So I want to touch on that. But I think the first thing is, is, you know, the point you brought up earlier, Ron, is why in the world would you go from, you know, being an entrepreneur, working for yourself, you know, your entire life? You know, I started my company at age 28, you know, after uh, the farm I worked on with my dad, you know, went bankrupt. Uh, so that bankruptcy put me back to grad school. You know, I got my MBA at Wharton and started a business there in my second semester with, you know, one employee, and that was me. Uh, mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, you know, the business has been my life. And I love business, and but you really can't move the needle to the level in which I'd like to do so to address the problems that are so intractable in society. And so I've been trying to take this public public position to drive solutions and funding to areas that folks just frankly are voiceless. They've got nobody standing up for them. First piece is opioid addiction. So we lose, you know, we're getting ready to crank through 100,000 deaths with COVID. Wow. Every year we've lost 70,000 deaths with addiction. So that's over 400,000 people have died already for opioid addiction. So it was, I believe, the number one issue in America. It wasn't getting the approach and focus it should. You know, I lost a nephew, he died of fentanyl at the end of 2016. You know, he was 24, and everybody has an addiction story that someone has been lost. So, you know, by getting this uh, front and center in my work in Congress, you know, we can literally move billions of dollars and create focus. In the HEROES Act, there's a $1.5 billion for opioid addiction going through SAMHSA. So that is a huge piece of change, and, you know, why... In my private life, we do an awful lot of philanthropy. You know, Total Wines worked in philanthropy, you know, every, across the country. It's part of our model to 
be part of the community. And that philanthropy connects us with the community. But, you know, we could, you know, this is a billion and a half dollars that we're going to move toward addiction. Uh, second big piece is mental health. And right now, that is such an under addressed part of society uh, in America because of the stigma and people don't want to talk about it and say, hey, you know, my family's had issues in this and we really think this could get more attention. Uh, so that's another piece uh, that we've been driving. It ties in, of course, with addiction because they often run together. No question about that. So in this new bill that just came out, you know, we were able to get $4.75 billion I spoke to the speaker twice myself, one-on-one, -on -one, about mental health, addiction, and those issues I care for. And, you know, so she absolutely gets it and has really made real efforts. Uh, but that 4.75 is to NIH largely to help on research on mental health. So, you know, how do, what's going on in the brain? It's all brain research. Uh, also, we have another $3 billion for mental health clinic and addiction clinics throughout the country. So those are billions of dollars that we're able to move to people that really need help. Um, and of course, the other part that I've tried to lead and have led the Democratic side in the House is NIH funding. Uh, so last year, we got a $2.8 billion increase in NIH funding. That was the biggest increase we've ever, ever had in NIH funding. And I work with Republican Roy Blunt in the Senate. So Roy, uh, who's a you know good man? He's got one of his children goes to school right at the Bullis School in Potomac, and uh, you know so Roy works on the Senate side. I work on the House side of how we can drive more money there, and everybody in this call gets this completely. The ROI at NIH is eight to one. So who here is not investing every dollar we've got from an eight to one? And they've consistently been able to do this because these ch challenges are so huge. And once you, you hit the magic bullet, uh, the savings across society are just monstrous. So those are areas that, you know, we couldn't really focus on to the degree which I can now. Because I'm helping spend your money. And so I'm a, a steward, literally a steward for your money. And, you know, thinking that what do we really need for those people that are voiceless? And um, that's, that's really why I ran for Congress. Uh, and I think that... Well, there's a lot of BS you got to put up with, a lot of wasted time uh, that I put up with that's just really going nowhere. Uh, but we're really able to reach out and touch a lot of people that, you know, have nobody standing up for them. Uh, so that's, that's my focus. In the area of the new bill that just came through, uh, the HEROES Act, I'll just touch on it briefly, but the HEROES Act absolutely has to get passed in some form, and it will get passed in some form. There'll be pushback by McConnell, the White House, could go on a couple more weeks, but at the end of the day, states going bankrupt, counties going bankrupt, cities going bankrupt, it's just not a really good idea. I mean, yeah, maybe it worked for Trump six times to go bankrupt, uh, but you know, that's something I never thought about in my business, and I would, you know, my farm went bankrupt, and when we went bankrupt on that farm, they took everything we had from our house and on down. So bankruptcy wasn't any fun. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't a good day. Um, but, you know, making our local governments, we're going to have to, in states, lay off police, lay off teachers, cut back on education, cut back on our hospital funding. So all these things are going to directly impact all the citizens, Republicans, Democrats, it doesn't matter. It's just a stupid, stupid idea to let these states go bankrupt. And then to say they're mismanaged, I mean, that's just the biggest bunch of BS. I mean, maybe some have been mismanaged, but they have to balance their budget every year anyway. So they have to balance their budget. So, you know, it's not like they're running a deficit and we're asking the American people to pay for that. New York, New Jersey got hammered. That's because, as we know, it came from China, went to Italy, went to France, went to Germany, and then came in through JFK and Newark and those airports and hit that area first. So from Europe, it came into the New York metro area because that's the gateway to the U.S. But last time I checked, we're one country. We're not 50. Uh, so we ought to treat it that way and treat everybody with equal respect 
uh, to help everybody. So a trillion dollars of this HEROES Act is for state and local government. That's the biggest piece there. And of course, there's 75 billion for testing, tracing, and then quarantine. We're gonna need literally 200,000 tracers to, because that's the smartest thing to do. And that's what uh, Total Wine did uh, as soon as they had problems. You know, they set up a program where once anybody was identified as being positive, they went back and traced who they had been near for previous 14 days using the camera systems in the store, isolated all those people, sent them home, full pay, and they stayed isolated. And that's how you stop the spread of this. But if you don't do that, uh, you're whistling Dixie, and it's going to just continue to spread. Uh, so that's in this bill. There's a lot of money in for hospitals, um, a lot of money in for housing, uh, which is a major issue. But a couple things just want to touch on, and that is the piece here on what was fixed in the PPP. Because a lot of these businesses, um, there's a new piece that creates a carve out if where 25% of the funding in this new piece uh, can go to 10 or fewer employees. So real small companies can take advantage of this. Now there's also a carve out for nonprofits. Again, 25% of the PPP money and the new bill does go to those nonprofits. Then flexibility, our restaurants, small businesses said, I can't spend that money in eight weeks. We haven't reopened. So it takes that eight weeks and makes it 24 weeks. So it goes to the end of the year where they can spend the money they take from PPP, which is a loan, which turns into a grant. These companies need grants. They don't need leverage because they aren't going to succeed with more leverage, even though interest rates are dirt, you know, really, really low, obviously. So the other piece uh, that it changed the 75-25 rule also. So our restaurants, you know, they said 75% had to go to employees, 25 to other. But things have turned on their head. I mean, right now, you look at the coefficients on cost, your labor coefficient has dropped like a rock as your throughput, your revenue has dropped also. So what's increased is the, heavy, the cost of your rent coefficient and those other fixed costs. So more of this money needs to go to some of those relatively fixed costs and less going to a variable cost, you know, in your team members. So we've worked on those things. We worked on the cafeteria plans and we got the folks at the, we got the folks at the uh, treasury to reinterpret that. So now your cafeteria money, you won't lose it at the end of the year and it'll actually roll over to the following year. So there's a number of good things that are in this bill uh, that I think will really be helpful uh, and it will get passed. Uh, the first bill was done first in the Senate, and then that was the marker, and then the House worked on it, and it went through. And so this bill came out of the House and the Senate. It's probably not the Senate. It's pretty much Mnuchin. You know, McConnell doesn't really uh, bother himself with these things. It's really Mnuchin at the White House that will work with Speaker Pelosi, and that's how the deal will get done, and they'll reach a compromise uh, but we're not leaving states high and dry. You know, we're continuing unemployment compensation. And, you know, a lot of things didn't work the first time. And that's not to be unexpected. Right. I mean, how can you go from, I mean, the average tax revenue in the U.S. is over $3 trillion. That's the whole year's tax revenue. And we've passed almost $3 trillion already. And this is another $3 trillion. So our kids, your kids, our kids, my kids, we're all leaving them a heck, of a, a heck of a number, but there's really no choice. So people are pushing back saying, oh, you know, let's not spend this money. Someone's got to pay for it one day. They're right. They got a great point. But do we want to get really be, be in the depression? Do we really want to have bread lines? I mean, do we really want to be a complete economic devastation? We don't have to be there if we, don't go, if we address it now. Thank you very much. It was great to see you again.